Okay, thank you, and sorry about that, guys. Um, all right, so, yay, of course, now the projector is on. <laughs> okay, but I'll, uh, in a couple minutes, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, uh, call up the, the thing. Okay, so let's pretend that this is not a, a proof completion animal, right? Um, what do we know? We know this, so, so I'm just, if you don't mind, going to focus on mechanics, and as we need to, we can talk about um, the concepts themselves. Okay, so the mechanics are these. Uh, you use conditional intro as your structuring subproof, right, for universal claims that you want to achieve. Right, you uh, you know that the universal intro of the conditional variety is the same mechanical uh, move that you make when you see in a chapter eight exercise a conditional as your conclusion. You, this is just what you do. You set this up when you want to achieve a conditional. This is what you do. You assume the antecedent, derive the consequent. So we're going to set up B, and I'm just grabbing A as the name. Set up the antecedent, derive the consequent, so that we can say, look, from any arbitrarily chosen name, we've proven that when that name is both a B and an E, it's a C. So any B that's an E is a C, or every, right? Remember, the notion of the arbitrarily chosen name has to do with effectively saying, I'm grabbing a hypothetical name. Right, so if I want to name any one of us, right, so let's say I have a universal claim, right, so everyone is excited about the end of the semester, that means Sophia is, that means Janet is, that means Andrew is, Elizabeth is, right, Angel is, it does, each person I could name, okay, you are these concrete individuals. Our assumptive name is not exactly a concrete individual. By concrete, I mean, you know, uh, the, the individual, uh, individually existing thing that I, I want to make a knowledge claim about, right? I can make, I'm confident about making knowledge claims about Janet or Miguel, Andrew, and so forth. My arbitrarily chosen name is, yes, a name, but it's a let's suppose there's this individual named Blah. And that individual named Blah has these properties. What follows from that? And since it's this arbitrary, randomly chosen name, it means that it would apply, what I've said about it, B, A, C, would apply to every. Everyone I could name or everything I could name. So that's what entitles me to the universal. So 
So here's a, just a, um, a, a, an idea that I'm going to press on a lot today and, and through the weekend. Namely, you're, you're in a position now, I think, where you should take as a, as a standard practice asserting what rule you're using for your structuring subproof, for your setup. Do the same also for any subgroups, nested subgroups, sorry, right, further subgroups. So by the time you get to where you want to go, you don't have to wonder what you had set up, right? It's already there. So this will be universal intro from lines three to I don't know what. Okay. Now, we know that C, uh, sorry, we know that A is a C is our goal in the subgroup. What do we know that we do when we have an atomic sentence or, an, or a literal and negated atomic sentence as our goal? Right, negation intro. So, so bear that in mind. You might say, well, well hold on me. I, I kind of want to, I kind of want to look at what I'm given. I kind of want to have a, 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 a bigger picture view. So you might notice that line one is uh, going to be dismantled, right? You're going to pull the universal off, and you're going to instantiate each of the iterations uh, of the variable. You also know that there's no restriction on pulling the universal off. Uh, you're going to do the same thing with number two. You're going to further dismantle these sentences by way of what rule? Conditional elimination, right? If you wanted to bring, uh, let's just say, the first premise down without the universal from line four, you would just use universal again. Is that, is that how it works? Right. So, so once you've set up your assumptive name, you're now in a position to remove the universal because there's no restriction on universal elimination. If you removed your universal before setting up the subproof, you would be in trouble. We could talk about why, but just that's the you would be in trouble. So I could do it at line four without starting a nested subgroup. I could just do it. Yeah, you could do it. Yeah, room. sure. So you could say, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to instantiate my universal. And why am I instantiating it to the same uh, name as the assumptive name? Right, because now you've got the name A. If you're going to use your truth functional rules, you've got to have uh, the same name apply so that instead of you know A being a B here and B being a B, you wouldn't be able to work your conditional limb in that case. Your truth fun functional rules wouldn't apply, right? Remember, you have to affirm the antecedent, which means that antecedent has to be the or sorry, the, the affirmation has to actually be the same sentence of, as the antecedent. So this would be universally limb from one. And then, and, and Ramton's saying he wants to do this, I think you want to go ahead and do this at, for two as well? No, I, I wanted to uh, then bring down uh, B of A. Okay. So now he wants to eliminate the conjunction at three. In order to do conditional limb, Sure. Okay. So here, here's a point to make um, for, for what it's worth. There are times when the road, the logical road to your conclusion is fixed. And by that I mean there are no options, right? It's you must do this, then this, then this, and you can't mix, mix up the order. This is a case, this proof is a case, however, where it's more like fate. The goal, the outcome is, is going to be this, but how you get there uh, could vary. So, for example, you might decide that you want to eliminate your unit, both your, your a little, little, I'm spitting and I'm uh, tripping over my words. You might decide that you want to eliminate both universals before well, mounting right? You will have it, to right? eventually because that's sort of the problem. Oh, yeah, you but have yeah. to, but you might say, I want to do it first, right. or you do it the way you're doing it, right? right? You've got options. Right, so that's that's actually a nice thing to uh, to know. So now um, he's going to eliminate the conditional. Whoops. So conditional elim 
lines four and five. And then, yes, then we set up the, the disjunction elim. Um, and then at that point, when you're on one side, you will eliminate your other right, universal. Right, the D of A, I'll, I'll right. eliminate the same. So we say, so here's what I think Ramchand's thinking. He's saying, all right. So now as soon as I have my disjunction, I set up disjunction elimination. And what I want is A is a C. And then I move on to the other side. And now I'm going to need to uh, work my universal. universal elimination. And of course, I run out of space per usual. I'm going to erase and push stuff down in just a second. So, oops, wrong color. And then, oops, I'm still in here. Sorry about that. And then C, A, so that we get out. C, A, ah! And then the conclusion and per usual, uh, I run out of room, a full type. Our universal inside. So sorry for my uh, typical crummy board work. Uh, let me go ahead and number, and then we can we can walk through. So uh, seven was the start of the nested subproof. Eight, then nine is the second uh, sequence, and ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, so pause for just a moment. Can is is the are things too scrunched up or are you guys okay? Are we ready to do you need more more mm -hmm. time to jot? Or or are we ready for our um, citations and justification? Okay, so uh, eight is what? A reiteration of seven? So that completes one side of the disjunction elim. Uh, notice, by the way, that we're, we're working forward. But I want to point out that for some of you, it only seems like we're working forward because you've already worked backward further and now you see where you're headed and how you need to get there, okay? What we'll do when we work another proof is we'll uh, keep hammering away at the backward working, right? Because some of you may be saying, well, I don't see the end in view yet um, and so working forward makes me feel like I'm working simply into the into a void right into a dark space i can't see where i'm going literally it's too dark okay so we have reiterations and line then the sequence ends the second of the successive sequences begins and then we have again a universal elimination this time from two uh then it should be nine and ten conditionally lem and if I have my numbers wrong, please, please yell at me. Uh, then 12 is the conjunction elimination of, from 3. 13 is the introduction of the contradiction uh, from 11 and 12. 14 is the elimination of the contradiction from 13. And then um, we have 
fifth junction elimination at line 15. Six sets it off, and then seven to eight, and nine to 14. And then when we get now outside, we, we've now discharged our uh, original subproof. We're on line 16. We've already said that we're using conditional, or sorry, rephrase, universal intro of the conditional variety, and that's 3 through 15. Here's the, uh, I'm going to make the, um, the view a little smaller so we can get the whole argument up. Let's work through the second one. So um, as a reminder, your strategies are limited, right? You know that the way to work on an existential that's given to you is to eliminate it unless you're generating some sort of contradiction of that existential, right? So take a look at line one. You see an existential. You know that you're going to need to eliminate it. Look at your conclusion and you say, okay, I might uh, uh, derive uh, the claim uh, not A, A, that I, I'm going to name, you know, X, A again, and uh, then I generalize, or I might decide to do a negation intro, right? But you know that you, you are uh, forced, if you want to uh, peel off the quantifier for the existential, you're forced to uh, start up that subproof. Remember why it's got to be the new name. Do you remember we had an argument on the board on Tuesday? It was an invalid argument, right? Some animals are dogs, some animals are cats, therefore some dogs are cats. Invalid argument. If we misapply the existential limb rule, that is, if we violate the restriction that we have, uh, uh, sorry, that the... That if we violate the restriction that the rule asserts, which is the name must not already be in use, we end up being able to prove the conclusion of an invalid argument. So we know that we're going to peel off that quantifier. We're going to need to work a subproof, and it's a name that's brand new, right? What else do we know? We know that we're going to uh, eliminate the universal, right? So, so the process of generating or eliminating is going to be the same as it was in the previous uh, chapters. By that I mean in case in certain cases we are uh, generating a claim by subproof. Okay, so we've got there is something either it's not A or it's B. We also are told that for everything, if it's A, then it's not B, and if it's not B, then it's A. In other words, uh, for every X, it, it's an A, if and only if it's not a B. And then our conclusion is, something is not A. Okay. So, we know, we, we talked about the working backward, working backward, working backward, right? So we know we want to generate an existential claim. How are we going to generate that existential claim? Well, we could, so here are some options, let's pull them off to the side. We could assume it's not the case that something is not an A, generate a contradiction, right, and then get out, and we get, technically, we get not not existential not A, which is the same uh, as existential, whoops, sorry. So many parentheses flying around, I start misusing them. Right? So, so there's one possibility where we're talking negation intro. 
Another possibility is uh, we, at some point, have, it's not the case that A is A, right? Al is an apple or Al is an athlete, whatever, right? And then we generalize, so something is not A, or sorry, yeah, something is not A, um, and that would be our existential intro, right? Up to you. My uh, thinking is the following. If I want to try to um, categorize my rules, maybe this is a way that helps me think about my rules, I will categorize them as follows. I will say that disjunctiony limb and existentially limb have something in common. Namely, when you have a disjunction, that disjunction sets off a successive sequence, a disjunction elimination sequence, right? When you have an existential, that existential sets off a single assumptive sequence, an existential limb sequence, right? Contrast that, that is a, a sentence setting off a sequence, a given sentence, or an earned sentence setting off a sequence. Contrast that with saying, I want to achieve a conditional. So I assume an antecedent, I derive the consequent, and I then get out and say, I've just proven my conditional. Same with the by conditional, right? Same with negation intro. Okay, so disjunction limb and, can, and existential limb have in common that your, your given sentences that you then use to set off the assumptive sequence. So the in-class recording um, stopped unceremoniously. So what you're seeing is the um, our, our, is the proof, or sorry, is the argument that we had begun on the board. And um, what we're going to do is follow up on the two strategies that we had discussed. So on one uh, uh, side of the, um, or not on one side, in one of the Fitch windows, we are going to uh, assume um, negation intro. So we will say that it's not the case that there is something that's not an A, and the idea is to uh, generate a contradiction at some point so that we can get out of the subproof and though we could go straight to uh, the affirmed existential um, technically we introduce a negation since there's one already there that means now there are uh, two negations and then we will um, eliminate them. And I see that uh, I forgot my quantifier variable. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's one plan. Uh, another plan is to uh, assume existential elimination. So from uh, at line one, we're told there is something that is either not an A or it's a B. So either something's not an A or it's a B. Let's assume that something uh, is named A. So let's assume that either, uh, sorry, rephrase, uh, I, let's assume that either it's not the case that A is A or let's uh, say that A is B. And then from there, uh, at some point, we will uh, derive, or from there we start our derivation, at some point we arrive at the um, uh, generalization from, 
or sorry, let me rephrase that. At some point we arrive at the existential not A. So it is, uh, there is something that's not an A. And then at that point we get out of, well, it's not copying and pasting. So at that point we get out of our subproof and we say we've just proven from the assumption that either A is not an A or it's a B, that something is not an A, which means, therefore, from the elimina elimination of the existential at uh, line one through the subproof, we have proven that something's not an A. Uh, since we're here, let's just go ahead and uh, work this proof. Um, we know that since the conclusion of our subproof is an existential, uh, it is uh, very likely going to be the case that we uh, will generalize from negation A is an A to the existential. And now seeing that we want to generate the uh, negation sentence at line 5, we say that we can work um, an, a negation intro, which would mean uh, assuming A. Or more specifically, assuming A is A, deriving a contradiction somewhere, getting out uh, at that point, and introducing the negation. Right? So a negation intro approach. Alternatively, we can set off from line three the assumptive sequence or the successive assumptive sequence uh, that is dictated by disjunction elimination. So we would uh, assume that it's not the case that A is A. The sentence that we want is it's not the case that A is A eliminate that sequence, immediately start the second uh, half of the disjunction elimination subproof sequence, namely uh, assume A is B and derive it's not the case that A is A so that we get out and say, look, by disjunction elimination, we have the uh, sentence it's not the case that A is A. All right, I've already set up disjunction elimination, so let's go ahead and uh, complete the derivation using uh, disjunction elimination as our uh, nested uh, subproof sequence. So we can see from line four that all we need to do is reiterate uh, the assumption in order to achieve the goal of the first subproof sequence. So uh, on the assumption that A is not A, it follows by reiteration that we're saying A is not A. Now let's take a look at uh, the, so we end that, discharge that subproof, immediately start the second one. And let's go ahead and uh, notice that uh, our goal is negation uh, A. And uh, but we have, as our assumptive step, uh, A is B. So at this point, we need to uh, ask ourselves how we're going to achieve this negation. And remember earlier, I had mentioned that a negation intro is a way that you could structure your nested sequence. Well, you're going to uh, double nest now within your, the second half of your disjunction elimination subproof. Why? Well, uh, let's take a look at line two so you can get a sense of why I'm saying that we need to work backward from our uh, from the goal of our uh, second disjunction elimination subproof sequence. Take a look at line two. We have the universal that ranges over the biconditional. The if we say we have uh, so once we've dismantled uh, the the um, Universal. In other words, once we've eliminated the universal and we've instantiated the iterations of X with the name A, we're in a position to eliminate the biconditional, thereby 
making your contradiction explicit and then you get out in at that uh, moment you get out of the uh, nest d double nested assumptive sequence that thereby also introduces the negation which then completes your disjunction elimination sequence okay so let's let's see how this plays out okay so we're assuming a is a we're going to generate a contradiction so that we can get out of the subproof and say that our assumptive uh, assertion is not the case then we'll be done with our disjunction elimination so uh, from line 2 we eliminate the universal and offer A as the instance of the uh, variable B or sorry variable X then from 7 and 8 we get the sentence I'm sorry I forgot to eliminate the variable uh, from 7 to 8 by uh, by conditional elimination we have the uh, sentence A is not a B make sure that we cite and justify line 8 uh, and then we see that 6 and 9 are contradictories and that leaves us with the end of the subproof and then line 11 brings us back out onto the uh, initial nested subproof and also ends the disjunction elimination sequence. We're then in a position to generalize, that is, introduce the existential from line 12 to line 13. And then line 14 involves, or sorry, is justified by uh, line, or sorry, is justified by existential elim. The citations are line 1 and lines 3 through 13. And we check to see how things went. And, oh, I guess I did not um, cite. And then what's going on up here? Oh, I said I justified uh, with uh, intro rather than the limb. So, uh, it's a, another good reason to use fit, right? When you make um, a, uh, a typo, when you commit um, a typographical error, fit will help you. Okay, so that's one way to work through this uh, sequence. Uh, now here is uh, the uh, other alternative that we discussed. Uh, so remember, one of the things that you should consider doing is this. When you set up your structuring subproof that is the subproof that uh, is going to uh, ultimately be the justification uh, for the last line in the derivation uh, go ahead and assert uh, that justification sorry it's a negation intro forgive me it's right so that when you by the time you get to this line you don't ask yourself, now why was I doing this, right? You've already said by the time you get to negation, negation, existential, negation, AX, that you've set up negation intro. Okay. Now, you know you want to generate a contradiction. So what you're going to need to do is think about where you might make an implicit contradiction explicit. Uh, now, just as an FYI, I paused the video for a second because I realized uh, for some reason I had written out uh, the wrong first premise, so now we've got the correct one. Okay, so <clears throat> where are we going to uh, uh, be able to generate uh, contradictions? Well, 
we've got the negation of uh, the A statement function as well as the statement function A, the same for B. That is, we have uh, the statement function Bx and not Bx. But remember, too, that when we, um, when we make our moves, that is, when we make our contradictions explicit, uh, we need to do so after having instantiated our uh, quantified sentences. In other words, we need to provide uh, instances of the existential and the universal. And we also know that when we need to eliminate an existential, that is, instantiate the existential to uh, an assumed name, it has to be a name not already in use. So with that in mind, we're going to instantiate or eliminate our existential first. So we get uh, negation A, disjunction B. Um, and we know that we don't have any restrictions on our universal, so we're able to uh, pull off the quantifier or eliminate the quantifier and provide instances of the um, iterations for the variable x. Okay, so now that we know that we're setting up uh, our um, disjunction, uh, or sorry, uh, we're setting up our uh, existential elimination, um, the question is, well, what is our goal from that existential elimination? Uh, it's going to be a contradiction so that we can get out of that uh, subproof and say that the existential at line one, let me go ahead and uh, number our steps, the existential at line one uh, along with the subproof that uh, initiates at or is initiated at line four uh, and ends at line we don't know what um, is what gives us our uh, contradiction and then once we generate that contradiction we know we get out of our structuring subproof to introduce the negation we then will uh, eliminate the negation so that we end up with the existential negation a in other words, something's not an A. All right, so with that plan in mind, the next question is, how do we generate the contradiction uh, that ends the uh, uh, existential um, subproof, existential limb subproof? Well, we know that we have a disjunction, and when we have a disjunction, we eliminate it. And our goal for each of the uh, elimination subproof sequences will be the contradiction so that we can get out of the disjunction elimination sequence and say that from either side of lines four and the two subproof sequences, we have a contradiction. All right, so um, one way that we can uh, fairly handily generate our contradiction is between the uh, third premise and a generalization of our fifth premise. In other words, we can introduce the existential from line five. So we uh, generalize from the sentence A is not an A to something is not an A. And then we can assert our contradiction, right? So it's not the case that something is not an A is contradicted by the sentence something is an A. Now we move on to our uh, second half of the successive subproof sequences that um, the disjunction at line four inaugurates. So uh, we need a contradiction. If you take a look at line two, which we haven't yet used, 
and we need to use. We use every premise that's uh, given or that is uh, an intermediate conclusion in the course of deriving our conclusion. So we're going to eliminate the universal and that leaves us with uh, A is an A if and only if it's not the case that A is B. Now how are we going to generate the contradiction? Well we're going to need to dismantle our biconditional the only way we can dismantle our biconditional is if we have the left side of the biconditional, but that means that we're going to need to make a further assumption. Don't worry, however, here's why. You've done uh, something like this already. If you recall, you have generated a negation that is, you uh, in the in the um, derivation on the right side of your screen, you generated negation AA. You're going to do the same thing here, and then you're going to generate the same contradiction that you did at uh, line seven when you uh, generated the existential negation AX at line six. So let's see how this works. I'm going to make the font a little smaller just so that you can um, see everything, although I know um, you, or you can see everything on a single screen, but of course it, it, it's now a little bit harder to, um, to, to see the uh, actual um, notation. Can't have everything. Okay, so we uh, eliminate the biconditional. which generates a contradiction between uh, lines 8 and 11. Then we are back out introducing, oops, introducing the uh, negation from 10 to 12. which then brings us to the existential negation A and, sorry, let me go ahead and justify, cite and justify. So we're introducing uh, the existential and then we have once again the introduction of a contradiction right now and we've already let's just make this a little bit easier to see uh, we have already uh, cited and justified uh, everything below that last move except for the elimination of the negation Again, Fitch won't make you do this, but I think it's important to note that uh, step, that technical, um, technically uh, necessary step. So the last thing we need to do is um, cite our universal elim, and let's check everything out. Okay, so I've gone ahead and hidden the... Um, toolbars so that we have a little bit um, a better view of what we've just accomplished uh, is the negation intro route uh, less elegant insofar as it takes more lines than does the um, uh, route of existential limb? Yes, but it's legitimate nonetheless.